Hello everybody and thank you for joining us for this session of the Privacy Rules webinar series. My name is Alessandro Di Mattia, I'm a member of the managing team of Privacy Rules and I'm joined today by our colleague from China and Russia that are Sofia Han from the Chinese law firm Zonglun and uh, Stanislav Rumiansev from the Russian law firm Gorodisky and Partners. I'm really glad to speak with them today because we are going to discuss two very interesting main topics that are the data localization requirements and the data flow between those two countries. In order to better address those topics, uh, we are going to touch six different subjects that are divided with the six different slides uh, that you can also find and download on our comments below. Uh, those slides will be uh, related to the legislation structure in the two countries, the applicable scope of the legislation in the two countries, and then the definition of personal data, so that we can then move on the real topic of the day that are the data localization requirements and the cross-border data flows in order to conclude then with the liability and the risk connected to those activities. There is lots to discuss today, so without further delay, I would like to leave it to our speakers and I thank you all again for joining us. Hello to everyone. The structure of legislation in Russia is pretty simple. We have only one federal law applicable to all kinds of data processing. You can find specific rules regarding employee data, financial matters, and some other specific cases in other pieces of legislation. But the federal law on personal data is the main document. This document provides for data subject rights, main obligations of companies and other entities processing data, main responsibilities, functions of the data protection officer, and other important issues. Hello, everyone. It's been a great honor to be here to introduce to you about the uh, Chinese legal framework uh, regarding the data protection. Uh, you know, um, coming into effect on 1st June 2017, uh, China has published the cybersecurity law. Uh, which uh, established the legal foundation of the cybersecurity and digital protection. And you may see that it's quite uh, complex uh, of the uh, legal framework regarding the data protection and also the cybersecurity part uh, in China. Uh, you may see it on the slides. We introduced to you about the uh, uh, legislation uh, levels of all the laws and regulations and also the national standards regarding the data protection. Here we introduce to you and give a, a brief about the uh, difference uh, regarding the laws and rules and regulations here in China. And you may see that China has uh, plenty and quite different levels of the authorities, uh, which have uh, different uh, administration uh, govern power uh, regarding different industries and different kind of operators and companies here in China. So you may see that the Chinese legislation structure is quite complex uh, and we have plenty of uh, legal requirements and obligations for different kinds of companies here. This slide shows the Chinese legislation on cybersecurity and also the data protection under the CSL, which we mean the cybersecurity law here in China. You may know that uh, data protection is only one key part of the cybersecurity law. And we also set up several new obligations for companies, which mainly include uh, the following systems and schemes. The first part is called multi-level protection scheme for cybersecurity. Um, I may say that it's a quite different and special uh, legal requirements uh, under the Chinese legal framework because um, as we know um, to nowadays that maybe it's the um, uh, only country brings these uh, special uh, cybersecurity protection scheme here. And the second is a series of obligations of cybersecurity protection for network operators. 
the definition of network operators uh, is, um, is unique and special under the Chinese legal framework. And I may uh, brief to you uh, on next slides. And the third part is the identification of the critical information infrastructure. Uh, you may know that um, Chinese government bring these specific legal definition of the cyber information infrastructure. We call it as a CII. And the operators of these CII shall um, comply with the, spe uh, the special and specific uh, uh, legal requirements under the law. And the fourth part is about um, the personal information and user information protection scheme. Uh, here in China, we don't use the definition called uh, uh, personal data. We use uh, the saying of personal information. And you may see that the um, definition of uh, Chinese legal law and uh, the Russian law is um, shares a lot of similarity, but also shares several uh, differences between the two definitions of uh, the two countries. And the next part is the, do uh, the data localization requirements of the cross-border data transfer. And we also have some uh, spe uh, special requirements regarding the network products and services. And we share the uh, catch lock scheme for some uh, key and critical network equipment and specific uh, network products here in China. So you may see that uh, from this uh, legal, uh, uh, legal framework here in China, you may have the whole picture uh, of the cybersecurity law here in China, um, which uh, stipulates that not only about personal data is regulated here in China, we also have other kinds of data is highly regulated here in China. And besides that, we also have a series of obligations of cybersecurity and data protection here in China. So you may see that it's quite a complex um, legal framework here in China regarding the uh, data protection and also the cybersecurity law here. Thank you very much, Sophia and Stanislav, for this uh, brief introduction that uh, was very dense and that gave immediately us the idea of the difficulties related to the use of data uh, in uh, different countries and the differences that there are between China, China and, and Russia. Now, um, I would like to, to start discussing about uh, uh, the applicable scope, this time starting from you, Sophia, uh, of your uh, regulation in, uh, in China. Yeah, so this slide shows, may show the, um, the first big difference between the Russian law and Chinese law. You may see that uh, as the, um, the uply capable uh, entities here in China, we have two scope of the uh, legal entities. We call it, one is network operator, which means uh, the network owner, the administrator, also the products or service provider. So here you may understand, uh, gen uh, generally speaking, all the entities, legal entities and companies here in China would be deemed as network operator. So all the network operators shall um, comply with the cybersecurity law, uh, which uh, regulated uh, the series of the um, data protection and cybersecurity obligations, which I mentioned before. So the second scope of the legal entity and the responsible entity here is called critical information infrastructure operators. That means, uh, like I mentioned just before the operator of the CII. So the CII refers to critical information infrastructure in important industries and also the sectors, such as the public communications, inf uh, information services, energy, transport, uh, finance, public services, and e-governments. So you may see that the CII is 
categories by the different industries, and the um, how to define and determine which kind of infrastructures will considered as the CII. It's um, it's determined by the um, risk and result oriented. So you may see that under the uh, definition of the CII, which stipulated clear, clearly by the law, is that severely threaten the national security, national economy, and people's livelihood and public interest. So that's the definition about the CII. So you may know that not all the infrastructures uh, which operated or hosted by the companies here in China will be deemed as CII. Only the critical one, only the important as, and they have the um, fully and severely threatened to the public interest or national security and national economy. Here as that. So that's the brief of the CII here in China. Thank you, Sofia. And, and Stanislav, what about uh, Russia and the applicable scope there? The Russian personal data law applies to data operators. There are no GDPR style terms like controller and processor here in Russia. We have our own term data operator. The operator is an entity, governmental body, or even a natural person who anyhow deals with the personal data. The data operator must determine the purposes of processing and the means of processing. The data operator can also process personal data by itself or himself or herself, if we are speaking about a natural person. The data operator, uh, the data operator may also instruct some other party to process the data. I mean, to involve a processor. So if your company falls under this definition that you may see on the screen, then Russian law should apply to you. Thank you very much, Stanislav, and that's uh, uh, really interesting. And uh, we can now move, continuing with you uh, in uh, the next, uh, with the next slide that is related to the definition of personal data that is a really interesting topic. Um, I think it's really important to stress the fact, as you mentioned, that uh, those regulations are really different to GDPR. And that's something we always try to, to stress, the fact that it's not just about GDPR, but there are many other regulations that we need to respect uh, in particular when you work internationally. So uh, thank you, Stanislav, for, for, for underlining this point, and please let us know uh, more about the definition of personal data in Russia. The definition of the term personal data looks like the definition under the GDPR. It's really very similar. Personal data means any information relating to a directly or indirectly identified or identifiable natural person. And this person is called data subject. The only important difference is that we do not mention online identifiers in the Russian definition. However, according to the recent case law, online identifiers may be also considered as personal data. So Russian law use one size fits all approach. The legal term personal data and the definition is established for the whole legislation. We apply it all the time in all situations. And to my understanding, this is a very important difference from the Chinese legislation. I hope Sophia can explain how it goes there. Okay, thank you. And uh, as you mentioned that uh, the personal information uh, under the um, Chinese legal framework share the, um, a lot of similarities with the GDPR and also uh, made with you in Russian. But we also have some uh, quite differences between the two countries. Uh, the personal information here in China refers to various information which, which is recorded 
in electronic or uh, uh, any other forms and used alone or in combination with other information to identify a natural person. That's the definition under the cybersecurity law, which is the, uh, the most basic uh, pro uh, data protection law here in China. And we also have uh, a, sp uh, a specific definition, uh, which is stip uh, stipulated in the national standards. Uh, you may know that national standards here in China is not the uh, mandatory law here. Uh, it's, uh, it's only uh, provided to the companies or governments as the um, good practice uh, in the industries. But here in China, the personal information security specification, this specific national standards plays a key role here. Uh, not only about the um, data protecting, uh, processing activities uh, in the um, around the companies, but also play a key role here in China in the authorities and the uh, government uh, activities. So you may see that the key issues here. Uh, in China regarding the definition of the personal information, or we, uh, we may say that um, the personal data here, the two uh, key issues is identify, is identifiable, and also uh, the um, used alone or in combination with other information. So that's the key, uh, two key issues. Uh, under the definition of the personal information here in China. And, and I think, yes, now Stanislav can move on uh, with your uh, definition of, uh, of sensitive data uh, that is always uh, related to personal data, of course. The Russian personal data law provides for a comprehensive list of data categories that may be considered as sensitive data. The list includes convictions, statement of health, political views, ethnical origin, and some other data categories. According to the Russian legislation, in most cases, it will be necessary to obtain a written permission from the data subject to process these data categories. There are also some other restrictions and even prohibitions to process these data categories in certain situations. So regarding the personal sensitive information here, uh, you may see that uh, it's also the risk and result oriented. The definition of personal uh, sensitive information refers to the personal information that may cause harm to personal or property security or is very likely to result in damage to an individual's personal reputations or physical or mental health. That means we share some uh, similarities with GDPR or uh, the Russian law here regarding the sensitive data, but we also share a lot of difference. And you may see that on the slides, we listed the, um, uh, the examples of the personal sensitive information here in China. Uh, you may see that on the slides, uh, we set out several examples about the um, personally sensitive information here in China. And you may see that um, the bank accounts, the cars numbers, the property information, which are um, regarding to the credit and um, uh, financial uh, info of uh, personal subjects should be deemed as personal sensitive information. And we also share some uh, similarity definitions and categories of these sensitive data. And you may see that uh, the personal information of children which under the age of 14 here in China would be deemed as the sensitive data as well. So. Uh, in China, uh, we put the children's online privacy um, uh, into the scope of personal sensitive information. 
And once the data is deemed as sensitive data, the compliance requirements and obligations would be severe and higher, highly regulated um, than the um, general personal information. So um, under the uh, legal framework here in China, uh, the operators or the um, uh, data controllers sh shall obtain the consent of these data subjects and also notice the rules of the data processing uh, activities here in China. Then um, I will brief to you uh, the special definition of important data here in China. As I know uh, that in Russian, uh, you, may do, uh, you don't have this similarity of the definition of important data. But in China, the important data refers to the kind of data which directly affect the national security the economic security and social stability, or the public health and security. Which means that the definition of the important data or the key issues to determine why the data will fall into the scope of the important data is based on the um, results and legal risks here in China. And you may see that the national security or public health, public interest is the um, first uh, resort oriented here in China. So we set out several critical uh, industries here in the slides. And you may see that um, the categories may involve important data here in China. So um, as I mentioned, uh, that would give you the whole picture about the important date, data here in China. And the important data and personal information uh, will be uh, regulated links to um, the, the, date, the data localization requirements here in China. And I will give you a brief on this. Thank you. Thank you, Sophia. It's uh, really interesting to see that you have uh very specific peculiarities in, in China is the definition of important data that distinct uh, your framework from, from other countries. And now we can move uh, to our next relevant topic of today, that is data localization requirement. That is uh, something that I would like to start discussing with, uh, with Stein and Slav to have the Russian perspective now, and then move again to Sofia. The Russian law, the localization requirement applies only to the personal data of Russian citizens. The localization requirement must be fulfilled by all data operators who collect personal data within Russia. It means both offline and online data collection. If you have a global website, but this website is intended specifically for Russian citizens, then you must comply with this requirement. For example, the localization requirement applies to cases when your website is translated into Russian and you accept payments in the Russian currency. The localization requirement applies if the website has a Russian domain name. Of course, the localization requirement applies to all cases when you collect some offline data. For example, for marketing, and other business-related purposes. I can explain you how it works on the shim. Now I can explain you how the localization requirement works. Let's imagine that we have a data subject on the left part of the screen. This is the citizen of Russia. And we have some company registered in China. And this company would like to do business through a Russian office. This company would like to receive some personal data from the Russian citizen. What does it mean in practice? If the Russian office is in charge of processing and collecting personal data, first of all, the Russian office should establish a local database. This can be any organized array of data, beginning from an Excel file 
and up to a third-party data center located somewhere in Russia. The server can be located within the Russian office or outside, that doesn't matter. But the thing is that the local database must be somewhere within the territory of the Russian Federation. As soon as this local database is established, the Russian office must notify the Data Protection Authority of Russia about the address of this local database. And then personal data of Russian citizens can be collected and upon collection, this data must immediately go to the local database. After that, it will be possible to take a copy of this database and send it to the main hosting or main processing facilities, even if they are located outside of Russia. And then the head office can receive this information and process it outside Russia on the condition that the local database will be still in Russia. You should not delete the local database unless you complete the processing of Russian personal data. Of course, there are some rules for the cross-border data flows, and we will speak about them on the next slide. But now let's see what's the difference with the Chinese legislation. Thank you. And here in China, we also have the data localization requirements, maybe uh, quite different from the Russian law. Uh, the cybersecurity law has stipulated that the CIIO shall store within the territory of China about the personal information and also the important data, which collected and generated during its operation within the territory of, the, uh, of China. So you may understand that uh, the two steps of data here in China shall follow the data localization requirement. One is the personal information and the other one is important data. So to figure out which kind of data should comply with the law, and first step you may um, review uh, is to identify the data type. And the second manner is to see that uh, whether this kind of data is collected or generated here in China. So that's the key issues or uh, the definitions uh, to determine whether these, uh, these data should be localized here in China. Um, we only um, regulate the data collected and generated here in China. So as for the uh, companies or legal entities or the data controllers here in China, you may understand that um, there are two manners to, um, to, collect, uh, or, uh, to collect or process the personal information here in China. One is directly uh, collected from the data subjects and the other one is the indirectly manner. Uh, which means um, one legal entity collected or received these data from another legal entity here in China. So that's the two manners here for an entity to collect uh, the personal data here in China. So you may see that the scope of the um, data localization requirements under the cybersecurity law is only refers to the CIIO. That means the operator of the CII. But uh, the Chinese government and authorities has published a series of draft measures for the, the security assessment of the personal information and the important data, which you may see that uh, the personal information and important data by all the network operators shall follow the security assessment rules here in China. This means the scope of the um, responsible entities has been broadly and expanded from the CIIO to all the network operators, which means 
well, you may consider that all the legal entities and all the companies here in China shall follow the rules. So the principle here is to localize and store these personal information and important data here in China. But due to the um, specific business operation needs, the entities or companies um, could um, cross-border transfer these personal data and important data. Um, but um, as the principle here, these um, companies shall apply to the um, security assessment regarding these, uh, these data to continue the uh, data transfer processing activities. So we may see that in next slides. Uh, so as I mentioned before, uh, not only uh, about the, data, uh, the personal information and the important data uh, are highly regulated here in China, we also have some special business data uh, here in China shall follow the uh, specific localization requirements. So we set out several um, usual kind of these special uh, business data here to give you a brief and clearly uh, information about these um, uh, regulated kinds of data, uh, which you may see that uh, credit data, the financial information regarding the personal uh, subjects, and also the map data, as I mentioned, for example, the GPS data, and also the health information uh, and the uh, insurance data regarding the personal information and also uh, regarding the whole public interests and um, the whole publics here in China. So this kind of data uh, shall um, comply with the special requirements which uh, regulated and officially published by each authorities in different industries here in China. So um, uh, you may see that it's quite a uh, complexity here um, regarding the data protection legal framework here in China. Okay, so thank you, Sophia, again, and, and Stanislav, and now we can move to the next topic that is related to the cross-border data flows, that is probably the, the prosecution of what we have just uh, discussed. We know that in both your country, you have to, to, to localize data coming from the people uh, of each of them, and that's really interesting. So we can now move on and see how you can have a flow of those data, and I would like to start again with Stanislav uh, and then move to Sophia. According to Russian law, cross-border transfers of personal data are permitted. However, there are two groups of countries. The first group is the countries ensuring an adequate level of data protection. The data can be freely transferred to such countries, I mean to the territories of such countries, without any specific formalities. The second group is the countries that do not ensure an adequate level of data protection. Unfortunately, China belongs to the second group, and it means that we should comply with a number of formalities to send personal data to China. Let's go to the next slide. On this slide, you may see some derogations applicable to the countries not ensuring an adequate level of data protection. First of all, it is possible to send personal data to such countries if you have a written permission of the data subject. It is possible to get one, for example, if you deal with your employees in Russia. But in case of e-commerce, it may be really challenging to receive the written permission in line with all applicable formalities. That is why a very common derogation is the performance of a contract concluded with a data subject. If you have this contract and if it is really necessary to send the data 
to fulfill your obligations under this contract, then there is no need to obtain a permission. Russian law does not provide for any standard, standard contractual clauses or similar safeguards. Consequently, you should rely only on these derogations. So uh, let me introduce the security assessment scheme regarding the cross-border data, uh, data transaction here in China. So you may see that in China, these two kinds of data, personal information and also the important data, um, shall fall into the scope and apply to the cross-border cybersecurity assessments before the uh, cross-border uh, transmission activities. And uh, these kind of measures are only draft versions. Uh, for now, there's, uh, they are not um, officially published yet, but it is assumed to be published next year. So um, as for the foreign companies or uh, national companies here in China, um, shall pay um, important attends, uh, intentions to these cross-border transfer measures. And you may see that regarding the personal information, uh, before the cross-border transfer, the operators, all uh, you may understand as the uh, data controllers, have to um, obtain these consents of the data subjects. It's the first step. And then you, may, uh, you shall apply to the local cyberspace administrations uh, for the security assessment uh, activities. So that requires um, the companies to apply for and file uh, with the um, local uh, administrations with the kind of data, the scope of this data, or the volume of this data, such as this. And regarding the important data, which um, before the uh, cross-border transfer activities, uh, the operators and the legal entities shall report to the, um, uh, to the departments for approval. That means um, only filing is not uh, enough for these um, important data cross-border transfer activities. And the companies shall obtain the approval from the governments uh, before the cross-border transfer of these important data. And this slide shows the uh, security assessment procedure regarding the data, uh, the personal information. And you may see that uh, the draft measures has stipulated uh, several application materials regarding the um, application and filing work um, from the, um, the data controllers to the local governments. And you may also see that um, the focus of assessments um, refers to uh, several key issues here. The first one is does the transfer comply with the relevant state laws, regulations, and policies? That you may see that um, obtain these consents from the personal subjects would be the principle here. And the second uh, key issue is, can the contract terms fully protect the rights of the personal information subjects concerned? This means to protect the personal uh, data subjects here in China. The, uh, the data receiver outside of China should also comply uh, these um, regulations and fully pr protect these uh, rights regarding the uh, personal uh, su data subjects. And the next key issue is that can the contract be effectively carried out? And fourth one is whether the network operators or receiver has a history of infringing on the rights of personal information subjects or had a, a major cybersecurity incidents in the past. Uh, that's the key issues to check out 
whether the um, receiver outside of China has the same protection uh, abilities uh, as the operators here in China. And the next one is whether the network operator obtains the personal information at issue in a legal and legitimate manner. And that means that um, the, um, the collection and processing of the data should uh, clearly com comply with the laws and regulate it. And then you may have the legal base to cross-border transfer it to the outsiders. And you may see that the security assessment is to be complete within uh, 14 working days. And um, as for the, com uh, the complicated, uh, complicated uh, cases, uh, the timeline may be extended. Well, the, the whole picture here uh, regarding the uh, cyber, uh, regarding the uh, cross-border data transfer uh, of the uh, assessment procedure is only on uh, in the dra draft measures, which is not um, officially published yet. So um, once these measures is um, will come into effect in the next year. The structure here may be uh, varies and has some changes. Okay, thank you very much Stanislav and, uh, and Sofia for this very interesting overview on the regulation in your respective country. And uh, now that we, we have an idea on uh, what we uh, are talking about, I think we can move to the last uh, topic of the day that is the one related to liability. And, uh, and I think it's one of the most interesting ones for, for our listeners because they are, everyone is always frightened about uh, the risks related to the use of data. And uh, we want to give them uh, an idea on which are the risks when you don't comply with the Russian and the Chinese uh, regulation. So we uh, have now uh, an overview from, from Russia and then we will move again to the one of uh, China. Russian law provides for several types of liability. In most cases, personal data breaches may lead to administrative fines. The fines can be imposed on the companies and their managers. In most cases, chief executive officers and the data protection officers. The maximum amount of fine was established on 2nd December 2019. Last week, Russia established new fines for breaching the personal data localization requirement. For the first time breach, the maximum fine is around 85,000 euros. And for the repeated breach, the amount of fine can be more than 250,000 euros. So it's really important. Sophia? Yeah, so uh, let me introduce the liabilities here in China. So regarding the um, personal data protection scheme, uh, most case um, is referring to the administrative publishments. But you may see that here in the slides, uh, not only the penalties here uh, in China as the um, administrative measures, uh, manners. We also have the warning um, and detention and also the ease of the business operations uh, or revoke of the business license. So that may um, severely impact the business operations here in China if the companies um, illegally collect or process these personal information here in China or illegally cross-border data transfer uh, to the uh, outside of China. So uh, another key difference is here, maybe from China to um, the most uh, foreign companies, uh, is that under the Chinese legal framework, we, have, uh, we also have the criminal liabilities 
regarding the illegal processing of personal data. So uh, as we all know that under the GDPR or um, under the Russian law here, um, we, we have different situations regarding the liabilities. But in China, the criminal, uh, criminal liabilities is the severe one. And the infringement of the citizens' personal information cases is highly increased these years. So you may see that on the slides, uh, there are, um, generally speaking, there are three uh, kinds of illegally processing activities which may fall into the scope of the criminal liabilities here in China. The first one is illegally obtain and sell or provide more than 50 pieces of the personal information. Re regarding the communication, the credit uh, information or, pro uh, or property information. So you may see that the, um, the amounts of these data is quite low. So the um, possible of uh, to uh, deemed as a crim criminal liabilities, um, I mean, the um, opportunities is uh, quite higher than uh, maybe any other illegal processing activities in other countries. And the second one is illegally obtain and sell and provide more than 500 pieces of Accommodation information, communication records, health and uh, physiological information, transaction information, and other personal information that may affect personal and property safety. And the third one is illegally acquire, sell, or provide more than 5,000 pieces of personal information other than personal information provided above. Uh, so you may see that these three uh, general kind of uh, illegal processing activity is also uh, legal risk and result oriented. Uh, because here in China, uh, the legislative uh, activities uh, is mainly uh, determined and um, highly regulated based on the results. So once the illegal uh, obtain or processing activities is highly um, or severe impact the personal uh, data subjects uh, their their um, rights or their uh, security and their health security and then it may trigger the um, criminal uh, criminal like uh, liabilities here in China. So I think that's uh, that may. Mm, that may be the uh, big differences uh, from the Russian uh, legal framework. Sofia Stanislav, thank you very much for your really interesting and deep explanations. I really also want to thank our listeners of today and I invite them to contact you for any issue related to the use of data, but not only since we know that your firms have a great expertise also on other matters. So I invite them to look for your firms at zonglun.com and at gorodisky.com. And uh, I would uh, also like to invite them to download the slides that they can find on the comments below because there they can find many other information on the experience of those two great experts that we had with us today. So in conclusion, I would like to thank you all and I hope to see you very, very soon again.